pleasure too. I work now with UNESCO in Paris, um, dealing with a number of, of things that all relate to the issue of inclusive development and inclusive policies, and more specifically, how uh, we use evidence for an applying to inclusive policies. Thank you. My name is Irakli Kodeli. I'm currently based in Jakarta, working for UNESCO Regional uh, Bureau for uh, ASEAN Pacific uh, in Jakarta. Um, social and human sciences is what we do, and the um, easiest way to express that, I think, is by our motto, which is learning to live together. And I like that because uh, living together uh, is not something that comes naturally to us as human race. I think that it has been a long learning curve and we're still on that curve. Um, and and we are act actively engaged in the process of um, learning just, just how to do it. So, um, I work on a program that is called uh, MOST, Management of Social Transformations, and the whole purpose of the program is to improve social science interface with policy making. Now, this program has a number of themes that are regularly revisited by our member states, by countries uh, that are members uh, and parties to, to this program. And the key theme now is inclusive development. Uh, why? Because of the sustainable development goals and the entire agenda being premised on the phrase that is, is uh, uh, now popular uh, coming from the leaving no one behind. And then six of these SDGs are really framed and grounded in inclusiveness in different shapes and forms, for example, inclusive education, inclusive urbanization, inclusive economic growth, uh, inclusive uh, institutions, inclusive systems, and then the famous SDG 10 on uh, inequalities, um, which again is all about inclusiveness. So the theme comes from there, it is now a banning topic uh, for the member states and for the countries that, that voted and adopted the SDGs and uh, by uh, definition uh, to us working in the UN and to many many others working on issues of, of development. Thank you. Uh, so uh, all of that uh, we try to apply here uh, at the field level uh, with the countries that we cover mostly. This is uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, uh, Timor-Leste, Brunei, but also in other uh, parts of the world. Um, two specific things that were not covered by uh, Yulia specifically, uh, two specific projects. One is bioethics. That's also about social inclusion. This is about implementing the universal norms that we have in uh, life in biological sciences that have to do with equity, uh, justice and equality in the way uh, resources are distributed in healthcare. Very important topic, uh, but from the specific bioethical approach, uh, approach of universal norms and principles, and also an area called sustainability science, which is again about social inclusion as in sustainability science we employ social sciences to make the natural sciences um, serve the people. So we, the natural scientists have uh, long realized that in order for us to be able to address the pressing uh, uh, socio-environmental issues we have to start from the people, you know, from the very definition of what the problem is people have to be engaged and natural scientists with all due respect to them might not be the best people to engage with the communities with the local and so uh, that's where we come in as social and human sciences uh, with our methodologies of uh, engaging these people uh, the communities in this process so just to stress the point that everything that we do in social and human sciences are uh, 
linked to sustainable development goals and specifically to this uh, uh, noble aim to make sure nobody is left behind. First, a very, very good question, and second, uh, I think there is no uh, universally mm. agreed answer to it. Uh, so the first thing is uh, inclusive development as a term is uh, complicated, complicated to reconcile internationally because different countries have different understandings of it. Also, um, it is somehow not related to the concepts that we already know, such as uh, justice or inequalities or, or redistribution. Inclusive development stands for all of it. And if we read the, the SDGs, um, that's what they say because they approach the problem from many different angles. Uh, from economic, from social, from uh, uh, cultural perspectives? Actually, I don't like definitions. I, uh, for instance, when we work in the area of bioethics, we have a universal declaration on bioethics and human rights, which does not define what bioethics is. Mm -hmm. That declaration is the scope of bioethics. I mean, that gives you a scope. If you ask me what is social inclusion, I'll tell you, read the 2030 Agenda and the 17 uh, SDGs there, that will give you an idea don't of, provide of, of the, but definition um, can be counterproductive because then people will run with it and say, well, this is, you know, social. I think it's such an expensive and all-encompassing uh, concept that um, sometimes definitions definitions might not uh, might not be very construct. I mean, they might not be very useful for practical purposes. That's exactly what. I work in the management of social transformation uh, uh, program and the whole idea is to bridge uh, science, social science and practice policy practice in, in this case. Uh, so one of the things uh, we do to, to meet this mandate in the area of inclusive development is the so-called inclusive policy lab. And the whole point is to um, enable crowdsourcing and co-creation of knowledge uh, by different stakeholders and then its application to uh, the and in the area of, of inclusive policies. So as a program we work uh, with free stakeholder communities so-called, meaning we serve social science research community, uh, policy makers and development uh, practitioners slash social, social actors. So all of these stakeholders, all of these groups are served by the lab. And we bring them into this project, allowing, giving, giving them the opportunity to uh, break and take apart the understanding of uh, inclusive development and what it actually means in policy terms because it's not that operationalized in concrete terms and when it comes to the application of the principles and, and, and the operationalization of inclusive development in policy terms, it's a difficulty. So we let these communities um, break the component, take it uh, apart by pieces and then reconstruct in ways that make sense to them by sector, by country, by discipline and then figure out ways of applying that knowledge to policy. So uh, how we do this? There are two components to the Inclusive Policy Lab. One is the online platform which is open to absolutely everyone working in, in this area. It's addressed to expert communities, but what we mean by expert communities is everyone who has a stake in inclusive policies and knowledge in, in this area. So the, inclusive, the, the online uh, platform allows uh, and banks on their self-organization capacity. Uh, they crowdsource knowledge online, they feed uh, their knowledge into the system, they put it out there for the use of, of other people, they connect through the lab and build networks of, of practitioners. 
because because keep in mind that this is an emerging area so people actually are looking for knowledge and they want to 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 build their understanding and capacity in this area and find like-minded uh, uh, practitioners and that's the online component now there is a second component which is on the ground in country work and i will defer to to Irakli because uh, he's at the forefront he's doing it in southeast asia and he knows much better how it's happening yeah i um I think a good example to give uh, for what is the inclusive policy lab and why is it important is to refer to natural sciences, for instance, because um, ultimately we're dealing with the diffusion, uh, collection and diffusion of knowledge, generation of knowledge uh, globally. And uh, you have a lot of examples in the natural sciences, whether it's uh, quantum computing or uh, genetic genetic engineering. Uh, these are scientists uh, around the globe in uh, universities and uh, centers of knowledge uh, production working on how to advance knowledge in that particular field. Now, social inclusion arguably is a matter of no less complexity and some would argue of much higher complexity, uh, a wicked problem as we call it in social sciences because even the definition of that problem is a uh, definition of the question, uh, the definition of the problem is an issue, and uh, so, so how then the question is how do you link the people and the the another reason why this is very complex is that when uh, while on quantum computing you have quantum physicists and I, IT uh, specialists working uh, on it on social inclusion you have everybody working there is no. Uh, knowledge producers as universities, like I just mentioned for natural sciences, policymakers are producing knowledge, uh, uh, civil society organizations are producing uh, knowledge, uh, every layer of society is engaged in this. Um, uh, another given is that nobody has gotten it right. The, from countries from Switzerland to Timor-Leste, uh, they have different um, dimensions that they are working with, uh, different uh, uh, problems, but they are all nobody has achieved uh, of the optimal degree of uh, social inclusion they're all so how do we connect all these different actors around the globe to help each other uh, with the knowledge produced like they do in natural sciences for instance and uh, ipl is the best that we have uh, so far in in trying to c connect uh, connect the, the 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 knowledge towards this ultimate aim of promoting social inclusion. Uh, before developing the Inclusive Policy Lab, we had to understand what inclusive policy is and what inclusive development is. And there were not that many clues. Um, so we started from the SDGs because we, we started working on this on this issue before the adoption of the SDGs because we saw that the negotiations are going in that direction. We saw that inclusive um, issues will be at the forefront of that agenda. So we're trying to serve our stakeholders and and uh, um, our partners by equipping them with tools as when in day one the SDGs are voted and the SDGs are adopted, they have to start implementing. But many had questions, what is this and how can we approach it and how can we work on this? So what we did is, is break this concept by dimensions and by, by components. Um, what it means, theoretically speaking, bringing it back to, to uh, the well-defined uh, things of social inclusion, of social justice, of inequalities, of equity. And we approached it in the way we believe it should be approached, and science tells us that that's how it should be approached multidimensionally. You cannot talk about social inclusion only or f about inequalities only through the uh, lens of uh, economic uh, uh, inequalities, wealth and income. Uh, which is the case often, that's how it's approached. 
approached. You cannot approach it only through, through uh, the social side. You cannot approach it only through political uh, marginalization and political inequality side. It's a multidimensional concept. And when we deal with it, we have to construct and think about it in, in, in this way. So that's how we framed it. And then we tried to develop concrete policy markers, inclusive policy markers, meaning how you take this theory and all these very meaningful but theoretical concepts and you apply them to day to, in day-to-day -day work on policy and on planning in government or, or outsourced and, uh, and uh, done by, by other, other communities. No, yeah, I, I think uh, there are certain policy areas where uh, in, uh, inclusiveness has been um, salient in the discourse uh, for much longer um, than in other areas. So, for instance, uh, in a lot of people's minds, uh, social inclusion uh, arises as soon as you start talking about uh, disability. So, this concept of disability and social inclusion has been linked uh, from uh, some time ago. Um, uh, so, so in this area, I think that uh, in countries around the world, uh, uh, certainly in, in countries in Southeast Asia, um, the thinking about social inclusion is advanced. So especially in the communities of practice that deal with disability, they know more or less what it means to be inclusive when it comes to disability. That, for instance, uh, inclusive education is not about uh, guaranteeing that people with disabilities have certain type of education, but rather to integrate people with disabilities in the uh, regular structures and systems of education so they don't feel uh, excluded, just to give an example. Um, um, and then there are some other areas where uh, social uh, inclusion is um, less understood and less um, uh, it, uh, integrated as a way of thinking and one practical example is a project that we have worked together recently in Indonesia in terms of uh, effects of climate change on particular communities. Indonesia is very vulnerable to the impact of climate change and uh, it's uh, unequally vulnerable like everywhere else people uh, at the margins of society often happen to be the most vulnerable to the effects of the climate change a lot of times in Indonesia these are communities living in the coastal areas so we did an analysis of um, how inclusive are the uh, national frameworks on adaptation to climate change to uh, in terms of the marginalized populations uh, living in the coastal areas and uh, the finding was that it was, uh, there is a lot of work to be done to make sure that everybody is captured under this uh, national adaptation plans and we're trying to so that's an example of a new area where we're thinking in terms of inclusiveness and just to build uh, on on that um it's not a new issue, especially if you uh, frame it uh, in, in terms of inequality and equity and economics and economic policy has been uh, aware of it, on top of it for, for many years. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's applied and followed, but uh, a lot of knowledge is on that side. Um, we have produced uh, the World Social Science report on, on inequalities that was really taking stock of the knowledge, uh, of social science knowledge in this area. And I think it is telling that um, the vast majority of research uh, in this, uh, on this theme is actually coming from economics, while sociology, anthropology, gender studies lag really behind. Mm -hmm. And we can see this in uh, policy, when applied to policy, the same discrepancy. 
the economists and the economic policy, they understand what the thing is about, yet in other areas the understanding uh, uh, is, uh, has to be strengthened and there is a lot of work to, to do in terms of integrating these concepts into our legal frameworks, into our policy frameworks and then finally delivering services that, that uh, uh, rely and, and uh, further these this, uh, principles. Well, first is to um, phase out the disciplinary thinking or, in policy terms, the sectoral thinking. Uh, the problem, by definition, is multifaceted and multidimensional. When we talk about inclusive development, we talk about um, social inequalities, we talk about economic inequalities, we talk about cultural inequalities, political inequalities, and unless we approach, we understand this issue as such, and then we try to address it as such, nothing is going to work. So for the researchers, I think uh, breaking the disciplinary barriers between uh, sciences, and as uh, Iraq was mentioning, it's not only about social and human sciences, but also uh, with natural sciences, the, the disciplinary barriers um, in certain cases should be broken and, and uh, definitely inclusive development is, is one of these areas. So researchers should think more transdisciplinary um, and then policy makers should act more intersectorally. Uh, there are issues that uh, don't allow us the luxury of being sectoral one of them is uh, inclusive development, another one, as Iraqli was mentioning, is uh, climate change and, and the transition to green society. Because it's such a uh, multifaceted issue, addressing it only from one angle will not uh, sort out the, the problem. So the, the, the policy should be designed as a portfolio of action, a coherent portfolio of action leading to a well-defined and broken down by, by uh, um, indicators of performance and success, having a mega and a, a, a overall understanding of what we want to achieve, meaning that if education and social policy and economic policy is geared towards this, we should understand from the beginning and frame this issue from the beginning as, as such. Um, I totally agree with, the, uh, with that statement of uh, intersectoriality. Only through uh, a transdisciplinary approach can we tackle these very complex issues. Um, what I would add to it uh, is something that the researchers are uh, very well trained to do, but not so much the decision makers, is to ignore intuition, to ignore ideology when they're making um, policies, when they're designing policies, and to uh, use evidence as much as possible in the policy uh, design. It's uh, easier to say than to do because of the nature of politics. People uh, are elected to uh, you know, high political uh, places because of the political promises that they make. Um, and uh, and people, it's much easier to make decisions based on certain type of intuition or ideological commitments. Um, but uh, ignoring science has um, costs and sometimes uh, these consequences can be devastating. Um, that is why uh, in the recently adopted uh, declaration on ethical principles related to climate change that uh, UNESCO adopted, all the countries agreed on these principles, there's a principle there that using scientific knowledge is an ethical act in and of itself and conversely ignoring what the science tells us about uh, climate change in particular is unethical. Uh, science doesn't necessarily mean uh, just the research. Uh, it doesn't mean um, it doesn't mean knowledge coming out from the universities. Uh, it also means uh, indigenous knowledge, uh, local knowledge, um, but knowledge nevertheless and evidence. And just as a recommendation to, it was part of, of your question to um, 
social actors and development actors. Uh, the rhetoric on uh, inequality specifically uh, slash inclusive development um, may be negative or people may think that the uh, costs of exclusion are put and borne only by the excluded and marginalized. And that's not true. We all pay the costs. Uh, they come in uh, fiscal losses, economic losses, environmental losses, uh, um, conflict, uh, security uh, concerns. That's why the SDGs take inclusiveness and take uh, inequality so seriously, uh, because it really threatens the stability of, of societies across the globe. I mean, SDGs are, are adopted by all countries. Um, and, and by definition have to be implemented by all countries. It's not easy to bring everyone on the same page. So the fact that everyone came on the same page, it means that it's actually a real issue, that growing gaps and disparities put all of us at risk, and we all as societies pay a cost. And I think social actors have to raise awareness of that, that they have to explain to the public, because the public at the end elects and votes and it's a public investment agenda reducing inequalities doesn't happen with zero cost and uh, uh, through the goodwill of policymakers no they have to be given a mandate by the society and to do so the society has to understand why this agenda is important and i think social actors and development actors have a very big role because they talk to the people they are on the ground, they are uh, close uh, to them, also they hear what the public has to say back.